Hello, sisters. <clears throat> the Politics of Reality, Essays in Feminist Theory by Marilyn Fry. Preface. The main themes of the first three essays in this collection had taken shape by early 1974 as I began to teach a philosophy course on feminism. They have been central ever since then to the course I have been teaching at Michigan State University called Philosophy Aspects of Feminism. I want to dedicate this publication of quote unquote oppression to those students for whom the experience of quote the oppression lecture end quote at the beginning of that course was something of a rite of passage. I began making notes towards a paper on separatism Paul probably as early as 1970, but the connection between the politics of separation versus assimilation and the kind of boundary drawing that is intrinsic to, defi to defining of words and concepts grew slowly in my thoughts. The institution and construction of that connection was a significant part of the synthesis of politics and philosophy without which I would have had to abandon one or the other as meaningless. Since 1977, during which year I wrote some reflections on separatism and power, I have been exploring and clarifying for myself what woman is in the phallocentric semantic sense of the language, myth, and ritual, and how that helps to explain and maintain the politics of subordination, assimilation of women. As will become obvious to readers, this work has been much informed by the work of other great women, especially that of Ty Gray Atkinson, Mary Daly, and Andrea Dorkin. As a writer, I began in the academic environment where one prepares an essay and then goes before an audience and reads it aloud. Outside academia, people sometimes hear speeches and sometimes encounter someone reading a story or a poem aloud to an audience, but the oral delivery of essays is not familiar. These essays are written at least as much for the ear as for the eye, perhaps more so. I hope they will be read aloud, both in and out of academic settings. In most cases, the audience I imagined as I wrote was, the pro was that provided by the Society for Women in Philosophy, usually the Midwestern Division. The women of that society are a wonderful audience, attentive and excitable, critical, aesthetically sensitive, philosophically sophisticated and politically conscious, supportive, angry, stubborn, loving and logical. What more could a writer ask for? Publication, love and money, of course. At a time when it was what I needed, Catherine Nicholson and Harriet Des Moines provided the perfect opportunity for publication with their well-named magazine, Sinister Wisdom, where they cheerfully published what was too feminist, not to mention too lesbian, for philosophy journals and too philosophical for lesbian feminist journals. Though I did not publish a great deal during these years of editorship, the existence of that magazine was vital to me, for it meant that whatever I was working on could be published. I am indebted to these women for their hearing me into speech. Love. A writer could want the intelligent and knowledgeable collaboration, encouragement, and criticism of a devoted friend or passionate lover. I have had that, and I will make sure that she gets as much as she has given. Money. I have made a decent living through these years, as, as at the surface of both women and men have, in varying degrees at varying times, yielded to the temptation to think me utterly mad, even dangerous, and have nonetheless not tried, at least not concertedly, to drive me out, of which I am glad. <clears throat> Some people in the institution in which I work have been kind, helpful, generous. Some, like me, some appreciate my work. I count all that among my blessings. In addition to these already mentioned, the works of the following women have significantly and traceably influenced my own. Kathleen Berry, Michelle Cliff, Alex Dobkin, Susan Griffin, Sarah Hogland, Susan K. Langer, Kate Millett, Robin Morgan, Iris Murdoch, Catherine Nicholson, Adrian Rich. Perhaps it is even more important to name some of the strong-willed women who have discussed and argued with me about matters vital to my own work, both lovingly and in exasperation. First, Carolyn Schaefer, with whom I had been as long as I have been with Book, in whose erudition, thought, art, and courage, my work has many of its roots, and by whose criticism it has been purged of so many flaws. Others to whom I am grateful for their having the spirit to risk for the risky conversations that are necessary to those who would go all the way include Sandra Bartke, Claudia Card, Michelle Cliff, Harriet Des Moines, Retha Fowler, Allison Yeager, Catherine Mad Madsen, Nellie McKay, Pat Michalek, 
Catherine Nicholson, Sandra Siegel, Reggie Teasley, Sarah Thompson, Barry Thorne, Aileen Van Tessel, and many smart and stubborn women in my classes. These essays are time-bound and culture-bound, which should not need saying, perhaps, but does. The feminist thought and theory of college-educated white women has been far more accessible in print so far than that of women who have not enjoyed these privileges nor suffered the distinctive set of limitations that come with them. This work is undeniably part of that body of quote unquote white and college educated writing. It stands on those privileges and within, the, within those limits as well as on and within the privileges and limits of more particular than my own individual history and situation. To readers who may have been able to overlook the ways in which my thought is limited by race and class imitation or imagination, I have to ask you to take absolutely seriously both the warning and the invitation implicit in my occasional reminders that there exists a vast variety of women's lives, which I know just enough about to put which I cannot speak from or for. To readers who could never look these overlook these limitations because of the insult to you, to what you know, I only invite your criticism, but also ask that you use your own creativity and insight to make the best of mine, to carry out the translations and modifications, which will make this work as useful to you as it can be. Some have thought the limits of which I speak here are intrinsic to feminism itself. My life says that it is not so. I have moved from an inexcusably innocent a political Christian styled liberalism toward the flexible wisdom of some sort of polylingual politics of variety. It is a fact of my biography that that progress began with and almost solely because of my engagement in the women's movement. And when courage or honor would fail, it is the logic of the feminism to which I am committed, which compels my continued evolution. This feminism is in conception and intention a global politics. That is none of it. Oh, sorry. That is one of its greatest attractions and greatest promises. I and many others are growing into that politics, that promise. Growth is growth. Sometimes there are things that can be done to hasten it. Sometimes it just has to be left alone. It is not always obvious what is best. One does what one can. Marilyn Fry. <clears throat> Introduction. This work is a blend of philosophy and art. It is the partial articulation of a worldview of the shape and structure of the world as the, philosopher, as the philosopher knows it. It presents images and cameos, which by reflection and association suggest a larger story or picture of quote unquote, how things are. The point of the undertaking is not to find a present and present quote unquote facts new or used, but to generate ways of conceiving and interpreting which illuminate the meaning of things already in some way known and to sim simulate the invention of more new ways of thinking. What I hope to illuminate is certainly not quote unquote already known to everyone. Finally, of course, it is what is within my own ken and what I need and what I want to make sense. What I take to be known will be taken for granted far widely and readily among women than among men. Much of it is data of women's experience, and much of it I learned from the feminist scholars and scientists who have made it their business to discover, document, and present the quote-unquote facts about women and the situations in which women live. One of the great powers of feminism is that it goes so far in making the experiences and lives of women intelligible. Trying to make sense of one's feelings, motivations, desires, ambitions, actions, and reactions without taking into account the forces which maintain the subordination of women to men is like trying to explain why marble stops rolling um, without taking friction into account. What quote unquote feminist theory is about is to create extent is to a great extent is just identifying those forces or some range of the or kinds of them and displaying the mechanics of their application to women as a group or caste and to individual women. The measure of the success of the theory is just how much sense it makes of what did not make sense before. Developing theory of this sort is something like reading the varying patterns of the weather off a weathered landscape. The observations one makes on the ground are not used as data in any strict sense of the word, so much as they give one clues. One proceeds 
more by something like an aesthetic sense of pattern or theme by classical scientific method. Depending on what one has already figured out, a single detail of an anecdote from one woman's experience may be exactly as fertile a clue as a carefully gotten and fully documented statistical result of a study of a thousand women and literature or television sitcoms may reflect the shape and philosophy velocity of the quote unquote prevailing winds as intelligibly as rest as real life. The results of this theorizing are also something like charts of currents, trends of, and cycles of wind and storms, in that there is no implication that every single individual and item in the landscape is affected in just the same way by the same wind. One tree leans more than the other. One may be more flexible. One may be more sheltered by other trees. One may be older. One may have been buffeted by both wind and flood. Similarly, the prevailing cultural wind that would cool women's anger to depression or freeze it into self-reproach does not have the same effect on every woman in every circumstance. A quote-unquote prevailing wind always also is not absolutely constant. The trees by my house lean to the east because the prevailing winds come from the west, but they are not at every moment of every day suffering precisely that force from the direction. Sometimes there is no wind and sometimes there is a wind from the south. If quote unquote women's anger is forbidden, is some sort of cultural truth, that would not imply the force of that per persecution is always and equally upon every individual in every situation. None of us, in all our particularities, actually unfolds as a perfect printout of the stereotype of women that are promoted by various segments of the culture. None of us, in some perfect reflection even of the cultural forces we welcome or embrace, not to speak of those we deliberately resist. None of us obey all the rules, even if we want to. But the stereotypes, the rules, the common expectations of us surround us, all in a steady barrage of verbal visual images in popular elite religious and un ground vehicles of culture. Virtually every individual is immersed some most of the time in a cultural medium which provides sexist and misogynist images of what we are and what we think we are doing. Our conceiving cannot be independent of culture, though it can be critical, resistant, or rebellious. To that extent, to the extent that an individual mother, for instance, does not mother in the exact accord with advertising images of mothers, comic or religious images of mothers, racist images of mothers of her race, she is not independent of the power of those images, but in tension with it. Her practice is affected by that tension. Any theorist would be a fool to think she could tell another woman exactly what the particularities of that other woman's life reflect, or to what extent they do not reflect the patterns the theorist has discerned. Even so, it is true that women constitute something like a caste that cuts across divisions such as race and economic class, though although the forces which subordinate women would, would be modified, deflected and camouflaged in various ways by the other factors at play in our situations, we still ought to be able to describe those forces in ways which, make, which help make sense of the experiences of women who live in all sorts of different situations. I think this is possible and I have aimed to do it. But finally, such illumination cannot be delivered completely clear, complete and clear by one individual into another's history and situation, not even if the two are very similar. If one person's theorizing is sound and correct enough to be useful to another, the other still has to make use of her own knowledge to transpose and interpret it, to adapt it to the details of her own life and circumstances to make it her own. A note on the text. <clears throat> the conversations for uses of quotation marks and italics, or sorry, the conventions for the uses of quotation marks and italics in the text will be familiar enough to professional philosophers, but others who are accustomed to texts prepared according to the Modern Language Association style sheet or other such standard authorities, and some readers who are used who are unused to reading philosophical texts may want some explanations. I use italics for the titles of published books and periodicals and enclosed titles of articles, essays, and short stories in quotation marks, as is called for in standard style guides. Foreign words appear in italics. Italics are otherwise used solely to indicate emphasis. When the words are read aloud, italicized words and phrases should be stressed. Quite frequently, 
In these essays, I have occasion to talk to be talking about particular words, how they are used, and what they mean. To do this, I have I have to have a device for referring to a word. It would be convenient for me if every word had a proper name so I could refer to it by name, Tom, Martha, etc. <laughs> but then I should have to introduce the reader to each word that I expected to talk about so that she slash he could know which name belonged to which word. That would not be convenient. The device I use is that of forming the name of the word by writing the letters of that word between two apostrophes. Thus, the spinster has negative connotations to most English speakers. The word dyke does not appear in most standard dictionaries. The entire string of marks, including both apostrophes, functions in the sentence like a proper name would. Consequently, if the name of a word occurs at the end of the sentence or phrase, the comma or period goes after the final apostrophe thus. Mary Daly gave new life to the word spinster. I do not treat these apostrophes like quotation marks, since what is going on when one refers to a word is not a quotation of anyone or any text. It is simply referring to a particular linguistic entity, and the apostrophes serve just as part of the spelling of a name of that entity. It is more common for preparers of text to construct names of words by printing the words in italics. I do not do that because I do not want references to words to be confused with emphasis or stress. Ordinary quotation marks are used here around the titles of articles and stories and also around the words um, or phrases whose usage I will wish to indicate is questionable, odd, or otherwise remarkable. In quote-unquote mental health institutions, an angry woman is likely to be given electroshock quote-unquote therapy. Here, the quotation mark indicate um, the expressions they enclose are misleading, falsifying inaccurate terms for the institutions and the processes they denote. I also use quotation marks around the term I am using in a non-standard way. In general, when a word or phrase appears in quotation marks, but is not actually a direct quotation of some particular speaker or author, the quotation marks are a signal that there is something fishy, phony, non-standard, anomalous, or eccentric about its usage, and the context will make clear in what way and for what reason it is being set apart for the rest of the text. Finally, though my use of uppercase letters is normal for the most part, I do not dignify names of religions or religious institutions with uppercase letters. Hence, the word Christian, uses neither, used either as a noun or adjective, is not capitalized, nor is the word church or Catholic, etc. On the other hand, I do practice from time to time the deliberate reversal of standard typographical politics and capitalize such words as lesbian. The occasional use of the plural pronoun they, them, and their as singular pronouns where a singular and gender neutral pronoun is needed is also deliberate and should be chalked up to my politics, not to any weakness of my own editor's or proofreader's grasp of standard grammar. The usage of they, them, and their as singular pronouns is very common among spoken English, and I view it as harmless in the written language. <laughs>